Hi, welcome to another episode of Dave's Imaginations. Today, we're going to talk about our game from last night. That would have been Thursday, April 13th, as we had Sailors on the Starless Sea part finale. Finale. They've reached the ziggurat. Finale. But I thought it was going to be finale, but it wasn't. It's was finale part one. So uh, we're going to recap that. But also, in addition to that, we're going to talk about a couple of rules we stumbled on. Mercurial Magic, we're going to talk about that first. And then we're going to talk about tech rolls and damage rolls. And we're going to cover all that right after this. Well, this and then that. <laughs> I could use the practice. <laughs> Stay with me. <laughs> Let me put this away. I don't need to be holding this. So, uh, last night's game, a couple of rules that came up that we weren't quite certain on. First of all, was the Mercurial Magic. In the Dungeon Crawl Classics 8th printing, in the section about magic, there's a topic on Mercurial Magic. Basically, what Mercurial Magic is, all spellcasters manifest their magic in different ways. And uh, to determine how your character would uh, manifest his magic there's a table you can roll on and that's that's below this but so to determine what you select on that table you read here then it says when a wizard learns a new spell he rolls on this table to determine how that spell manifests in his hands and this percentile roll is adjusted by his luck modifier by 10 percent so that a plus two modifier would have been plus 20 percent on the check so uh, our magic user uh, had his spell he was casting. He's ca casting s a sleep spell. And when he first picked that sleep spell, he rolled on this table, or something rolled for him, because I didn't see exactly his what he had in this list. When he cast the sleep sleep spell, it's supposed to, the, the, the people affected by the spell are supposed to focus their future attacks on him. Now that kind of plays with, do they, you know, the sleep, if they pass out, they can't focus their attack, right? Because they're asleep. Now, maybe after they wake up. But they, in a sleep spell, when you cast that sleep spell, there's a will save. And, and when they did pass the will save, uh, they would have to focus their attacks on the, the wizard. However, if the, those players could not, I ruled that they didn't have to. So if, if, if in any way they could attack the wizard, they should. Now... There was a little bit of discussion on this because they had people in front of them. I should have. I had them attack the people in front of them. I should have had them like try to push them away so they could get to the spellcaster. That was probably the way I should have done it. So in the future, I probably will. But that is Mercurial Magic. And why don't we take a look at that sleep spell for a second. So the caster's sleep spell, uh, the caster lulls a target into a deep sleep. And there's a manifestation. So as he casts spell, this is what it looks like. Uh, roll d4. Now that, that's a little confusing between the manifestation and the mercurial. Mercurial is some additional effect. This manifest manifestation is how it looks. So in this case, he rolled two swans' wings rise from the earth and fold the target, right? And then, then there's now he never had a corruption. So the corruption and misfire only happen on a natural one. How many? How long? And the number of targets changes as as you get a better and better score. And then also, the, the, another thing in here is the will save. As the creatures make a will save to try to resist the, the spell, and in this case, the difficulty class, which is another thing that we had to figure out, was the difficulty class is actually the roll that he ends up with. So if he rolled a, I don't know, was it a, a 18, he might increase that difficulty class to a 19 by doing a spell burn. So I played it such that his end value, whatever that was, that's difficulty class. And, and so that's how we played it. So that's that's the spell question. That's Mercury Magic and a little bit about how the spell. In our game, uh, our wizard used sleep quite a bit until he failed, right? And then once you fail, then you lose the spell until the next long rest. That is Mercury Magic and spell casting. The next thing I want to talk about is attack roll. And this comes up occasionally, especially at this low level, that a, uh, a guy picks up something and wants to, to picks up a dagger or a 
or a short sword and wants to attack somebody and what modifiers they would they use on the attack roll uh, there is a specific section on, under combat for the attack roll and so i'll just just read that here the attack roll is his action die that you would find in, in your classes table and adds his attack bonus he also adds any bonuses from spell magic items or class abilities such as a backstab if the attack is made with melee weapon he adds his strength bonus if the attack is made with a missile weapon he would add his agility bonus now we're specifically looking at the two hit roll so if you, you roll a d20 you would add those modifiers to that now in addition to that the the warrior or the dwarf would also get his d die so i've been playing it he'd get his plus strength let's say a plus two strength on a warrior and then his d die of at level one is a d die is a, uh, a d3 and add all that up to your d20 roll to see if to see if they hit and of course you compare that to the, the your target's armor class so that's how you hit all right you add your, either your strength or your agility depending on if it's a, a melee or a missile weapon but then for damage, to see how damage works, we need to go back to the base ability scores. So strength, if we look at the strength, your physical power, lifting, hurling, cutting, etc. Your strength modifier affects your melee attack and damage rolls. So if you're swinging with that, that a short sword, then you would add your, your strength modifier. Now for uh, missile weapons, it doesn't necessarily, right? It, your agility modifier affects armor class, missile fire, attack rolls. That's your attack roll. That's not your damage roll. But it, so it doesn't add to the damage. Now, if you go to the weapons chart, looking at the weapons, you can see that all these have these little asterisks, right? And some of those asterisks or notations say that strength modifier applies to damage with this weapon at close range only. So that's the two star. So if we look up here at things that have two stars, we can see like the sling. The sling in the close range, right? Because we said strength modifier applies to damage with this weapon at close ranges only. So for the sling, I'd say that's the 40 feet. It wouldn't apply at the 80 or 160, but it would apply at the 40 feet. And then your hand axe, if you're throwing a hand axe or a javelin, a dagger or a dart, if you're throwing those things, then they would only apply at the shortest of the ranges that's the only time you would change your damage on a missile weapon with your strength is would would be at the shortest shortest range so next let's do our recap a recap of the game last night we our avengers had just crossed the starless sea in the boat in the dragon boat and made it to the the ziggurat and we can read the description of that ziggurat again so our, our characters approach the ziggurat. The island draws closer, revealing the source of the golden glow, a towering ziggurat with burning light radiating from within the silver-thin cracks between its massive stones. A wide ramp circles the edifice, sloping to the top of the temple. Hordes of beastmen crowd the ramps, howling to the darkness, hammering on massive hide drums and pushing a terrified string of prisoners to the ziggurat's glowing peak. High atop the temple, you can make out a fearsome silhouette of an enormous armored figure wreathed in infer infernal smoke lit from below. And then I showed him this picture of the Chaos Lord coming from the fiery pit. How we started, I didn't have a ship. I didn't really ship into my foundry. No, this is a foundry virtual tabletop. Uh, and this is just, I, I've gone into YouTube and I've started the video and uh, this is kind of where we began and we can see uh we had talked about we, one of our characters one of my players had lost all of his characters and so i put a cage with uh three peasants in, in it with all their stuff and a bag off to the side at the base of the ziggurat so that he would have someone in play so the first thing would be to get those three and so as they contemplated how, as the people on the boat contemplated how they're going to approach the ziggurat, how they're going to handle, is that when you look at the ziggurat, the steps to it, full of these beastmen, they are, there's 20 plus of these beastmen, and my, my players are kind of freaking out a little bit how they can handle all these guys. 
And as they contemplated, they took forever to figure out how they were going to handle it. So I ultimately put a timer on it. And I started moving a, a couple of the beastmen down to open the cage. They grab one of the the players, one of the players out of the cages. And this is one of my players, player characters. And this is the barber he got. And they start to drag him. They knock him over the head with a cudgel. They knock him out and they start dragging him away. Finally, the battle began and the, the ship came to the shore and everyone got out and they started to fight these guys off. And they quickly realized that these beastmen, they were easy to hit and they were easy to kill. They only had three hit points. Our, our, and about this time, early in these this attack is when our mage cast that sleep and we dealt with this mercurial magic thing. The sleep worked out for him a couple times. So back into Foundry, here we can see the, the entire Ziggurat Island. And this, this battle became quite the slog fest. It took all night, two plus hours, to deal with the 20-ish, and we didn't even deal with all 20, but with 10-ish of these beastmen. And ultimately, I thought it got boring. <laughs> I thought I got a little boring, redundant, as they're trying to go through each of these beastmen. And they're, are my pleasure being careful, right? As, as they should. Um, but, it was getting too long, and I and so I wanted to hasten it up a little bit. We ended the night with with even though there was a few of these left, the Chaos Lord has erupted from the fiery pits, and, and to symbolize that, we had a few of the of the beastmen thrown head over foot off the ziggurat and into the water below, and and it's just to symbolize that this Chaos Lord has come. And that is where we start next week with with uh, what's going to happen. How are these guys going to battle this Chaos Lord? So our party has worked its way up the Ziggurat, fighting beastmen after beastmen, recognizing some of these beastmen as a former clansmen. And, and they get to a point where the, the path ahead is cleared, and yet the drums have stopped, the banging has stopped and erupting from the fire pit above is a chaos lord they can't see this but they can feel they can feel the cold aura of chaos sweep over the entire island and as at, shortly after that happens they hear this this cry this roar of a chaos lord i described it to like a, a godzilla type of roar and eh, probably not that loud but it was a roar and and then soon after they see these beastmen being thrown off the ziggurat as this chaos lord seemingly is going to start making its way down the ziggurat and uh so uh, our characters gonna to have to deal with that next week so next week next week we're probably going to start with uh finishing resolving sailors on the start of sea but then we're gonna take on doom of the savage kings and that's going to be the last one before we decide whether we continue with dungeon crawl classics or maybe we go back to Dungeons and Dragons. So we'll have to see. So D Doom of the Savage Kings, and that'll probably take two, three, four, I don't know how long ever it takes to do it. And then we're gonna resolve that, and then we'll have to, then the group will come together and talk about where they wanna go from here. So that is where we're at. Uh, boy, what do you wanna do? Are you liking Dungeon Crawl Classics? It's okay. I, I'll tell you, uh, this battle at the end of the still is gonna start to see with the 22 beastmen that they have to wade through to get to the end. It's long. It's a lot. It takes a long time for to do battle. Uh, also, as you do battle and you hit with a critical hit or a critical fumble, all these charts you have to flip through. Maybe it's just my familiarity. This is brand new to us, right? We've only been doing it for a month or so, right? A few sessions in. Uh, we're still looking up a lot of rules, and that takes time. It's slowing down our play. So it's not the comfortable uh, game of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition that we've been playing for the last almost 10 years almost almost eight hey, baby that's really so fifth edition really did now they're changing fifth edition on us so who knows right so uh that's what we're doing that's what we decide and we'll make evaluation after we do doom of the savage king and otherwise i guess it's time to wrap this up wrap this up with a little more ukulele yeah. did you know i could play ukulele can't really play ukulele. I would say uh, uh, ukulele is fine. I have a minus one modifier on my performance skills. <laughs> so if you don't mind, hit that like and subscribe. I appreciate it. Otherwise, uh, check us out next Thursday. Until then, take care.